now a real pleasure to introduce to you George Weigel, who is no stranger to the Napa Institute. He's been a member of our board of directors from the very beginning. He's been a speaker here at almost every conference and uh, a very popular one, intellectual one, uh, a very stimulating one certainly to me to get my uh, own religious education and culture, faith, nexus underway. Uh, George Weigel is the founder, uh, former president, uh, now the senior fellow in the William E. Simon uh, Chair of Catholic Studies, uh, professor over at uh, the um, Ethics and Public Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is the author of a multitude of books. I, I know it's well over 50. And um, he is, of course, the author of Witness to Hope, the biography of St. John Paul II, uh, which, of course, won national and international acclaim uh, and a, a variety of different awards as well. It's been, pub uh, it's been published in, I think, and translated into 12 different languages. Uh, and uh, a truly a, a contribution, not only to uh, the legacy of St. John Paul II, but also a contribution to uh, international uh, uh, culture within, and, and, the ch and the church within the culture. Also, uh, George uh, has gotten um, 18 honorary doctorates, uh, far surpassing my number, just kidding. And, uh, uh, and uh, certainly um, uh, he is uh, very, very well known as a uh, speaker and, uh, and a presenter. He's going to be talking to us today uh, about uh, this Catholic moment. Uh, where are we now? The path forward. So our very prescient, very uh, brilliant uh, George Weigel, what an honor to be with you today. Good morning, uh, everyone. Great to be uh, back here at the Napa Institute Annual Conference. About 20 years ago, a Jewish friend who taught me most of the Yiddish I know, most of which is unrepeatable in polite society, asked me if I, if I knew the text of what he called the classic Jewish telegram. I said, no, what's that? He said, the classic Jewish telegram reads, start worrying, letter follows. <clears throat> There's a um, certain resonance uh, with that among Catholics over the past 18 months or so. We've all been worrying a lot. Uh, what I'd like to, to offer you today is, is the letter. Here's the letter that follows. The hardest thing to do, I think, or certainly one of the hardest things to do in life uh, is to read now correctly. With 2020 hindsight, it's easy to think that, of course, Ike should have invaded Normandy uh, instead of Calais on D-Day. It's easy to think that, of course, Neil Armstrong should have seized the controls of Eagle from the autopilot and made man's first landing on the moon, a man-made achievement. Uh, of course, it's easy to see now that communism in Europe was pretty well finished when John Paul II, as he put it, gave a rotten tree a good shaking. But none of that <clears throat> was obvious at, at the time. None of those things were obvious at the time. So I'd like to try and help us see now uh, a little more clearly in context in order both to understand and to respond creatively to, to this Catholic moment. My first point is that this particular Catholic moment should be understood in light of the great Catholic drama of the last 250 years, and that is the dramatic interaction of Catholicism and modernity, modern cultural, intellectual, social, political, and economic life. 
the rhythms of that drama have defined the rhythms of the church's life since the mid to late 18th century. That drama has unfolded in five acts. The first act was one of sharp confrontation. Although many of us tend to forget this, if indeed we ever knew it, political modernity, beginning with the French Revolution, tried to destroy the church in Europe. Not simply the French Revolution, but the German Kulturkampf, the Italian Risorgimento, all sorts of bad things happening in Switzerland uh, and elsewhere. And the church's reaction to that was essentially a preview of Nancy Reagan's drug policy. Just say no. Thus, in 1864, Pope Pius IX in the syllabus of errors, condemned the idea that, quote, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself with progress and modern civilization. This was a completely confrontational relationship. That began to change in the second act, which began uh, with the election of Pope Leo XIII in 1878 and continued through the pontificate of Pope Pius XII who died in 1958. And in this second act, in which most of us, I think, grew up, the church gingerly explored an encounter with modern politics, culture, society, and economic life, to the point where, in 1958, the third act of the drama could open. For in 1958, Pope John XXIII decided to gather up all of the energies that had been set loose in the church by Leo XIII, to gather up all of those energies over the previous 80 years and to focus them through the prism of an ecumenical council. In order to do what? In order to convert the modern world. If you read John XXIII's opening address to Vatican II, it's a preview of what John Paul II would later call the new evangelization. So the goal of the council was to convert modernity, yet lots of Catholics mistook the council as an invitation to embrace modernity uncritically. And in doing so, they began to empty Catholic faith of its ballast, as you just heard in that previous sponsor remarks. We are now living in Acts 4 and 5 of this ongoing, more than two century long drama of Catholicism and modernity. In this fourth and fifth, these fourth and fifth acts, thanks to John Paul II and Benedict XVI, the Second Vatican Council has been given an authoritative interpretation which has led to two crucial discoveries. First, over the period of John Paul's pontificate and Benedict's, the church rediscovered in reflecting on Vatican II, its essence as a missionary enterprise, a community of disciples in mission whose purpose is to convert the 21st century and the third millennium. And in the course of that rediscovery, whose roots actually go back to that Leonine revolution launched by Leo XIII in 1878, in the course of that rediscovery of its essential character, church as missionary enterprise, Catholicism began to articulate a social doctrine that in this early part of the 21st century just might help save late modernity and post-modernity from their increasing cultural and political incoherence. Now, if that's who we are, if we're a missionary church in which everyone is a missionary disciple, 
and everywhere is mission territory. And if an essential part of our mission is calling a decadent culture and an increasingly rancid politics to their senses, then we know what the crisis that first came into the glow of public attention in 2002 and then reignited in the past 14 months is. It's an essential and likely painful moment of purification. A purification necessary so that the church of the 21st century can be what the spirit-led developments of the past 250 years have called us to be. A church of the new evangelization in which each of us calls others to friendship with Jesus Christ, who is the answer to the question that is every human life. A church of cultural and civic reform, resisting the new authoritarianism of decadence and calling our fellow citizens to live freedom nobly in solidarity and for the common good. That's what this moment is about. It's a moment of essential purification so that we can be the church that the Holy Spirit has been calling us to be over the past two centuries. I've said this before here, it bears saying again. Now is a crisis of fidelity, and the only way to re resolve a crisis of fidelity is through deeper fidelity by all the people of the church, everyone. The only way to resolve a crisis of fidelity is a deepening of fidelity by all of the people of the church. The focus of public attention in recent months and years has often been on priests and bishops. But all of us, everyone in this room, everyone we know in our parishes, all of us are being called in this moment of purification to lead more coherent, more intense, more thorough Catholic lives. We'll hear a lot in the next few days from various of our speakers about best practices. Best practices in seminary recruitment, seminary formation, the ongoing formation of priests, the nomination of bishops, financial accountability and transparency in dioceses. Best practices are important, and as I say, others will address some of those. But best practices cannot fix by themselves what is most deeply broken in now. That can only be fixed by the deeper conversion of every Catholic. The resolution of this crisis rests on all of us. That conversion, that deeper conversion of every Catholic is essential to the church's evangelical mission, obviously, unless it is manifest in our lives that we have been touched by divine fire, by the love of Christ poured into our hearts, as St. Paul says, Unless that's manifest in our lives, we are not going to attract others to friendship with the Lord Jesus and incorporation into his body, the church. But it's also essential, this deepening conversion of every Catholic to the church's public witness in the United States today. The religiously different nuns, N-O-N-E-S, young adults who have absolutely no interest in religion, the hundreds of thousands of Catholics who have left the church, the Christians of other denominations looking for a church of doctrinal and moral solidity and coherence, our own children and grandchildren, no one in any of those categories is going to be attracted to Catholic light to the dumbing down of Catholic faith and practice 
that has destroyed the church wherever it's taken hold, especially in Western Europe, but also in parts of North America. The only Catholicism that attracts in the 21st century, wherever you look in the world church, from new churches in Africa to old churches desperately trying to give birth to new sprouts of faith in Western Europe, the only Catholicism that attracts and that grows and that is vital and life-giving is what I call all-in Catholicism. Catholicism that embraces the catechism in full, that lives the life of the sacraments joyfully, that manifests its faith in service to the poor, the marginalized, and the increasing number of walking wounded in our decadent culture. And it's in the context of this, I believe, empirical fact. Catholic light does not work all in. Catholicism has a chance and has proven itself that I'd like to just append a quick footnote to my remarks. Uh, a lot of you have heard Many say that the answer to the abuse crisis in the church, or at least one part of the answer to the abuse crisis in the church, is to relax or dispose of the discipline of clerical celibacy in Latin Rite Catholicism. That is a Catholic light answer to this problem. In the first instance, as I had the pleasure to remind Mr. Chris Matthews on TV a few years ago when he brought this up, I said, Chris, marriage is not a crime prevention program. <laughs> and to suggest that it is is rather insulting to those of us who are married. Secondly, we know The producer of that segment came out from behind the camera and hugged me afterwards. <laughs> we know from the sorrows of abuse in our uh, brethren of various Protestant denominations that a married clergy is no more uh, immune to the crisis of sexual abuse, which is a societal-wide plague, it's a plague throughout all of society, than, than a celibate clergy. And I might also say that any attempt to relax or remove, dispose of the thousands of years of tradition that lie behind the celibate priesthood in the Catholic Church uh, is to surrender uh, in a very uh, profound way to the siren songs of a sex-saturated culture that is killing itself and its offspring in, in indulgence. So that's a little footnote on this. Radical ongoing conversion, which purifies the church and puts those essential best practices in their proper evangelical and ecclesial context, is also essential to the Catholic role in American uh, society uh, today. Our country is in crisis, and that crisis is only going to be resolved uh, in such a way that our democracy endures if America experiences a new birth of freedom rightly understood. Freedom rightly understood is not freedom as I did it my way, to quote, quote the great moral philosopher Frank Sinatra. Freedom rightly understood is not a freedom of indifference to moral truth about the inalienable dignity of the human person from conception until natural death. Freedom rightly understood is not a freedom detached from reality so detached from reality that it abandons any notion that there are givens in the human condition, including now 
the givens of our being created as male and female. Rather, freedom rightly understood, I assume you're applauding male and female. Yeah, that's, that's good. Vive la différence. <laughs> freedom rightly understood is freedom conceived as the founders imagined it. Freedom tethered to moral truth. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Freedom tethered to moral truths that everyone can grasp. Freedom lived for the common good, as well as in pursuit of my individual destiny. Freedom lived in solidarity with those for whom living freedom is difficult and, and burdensome. The major role in contemporary America in bringing uh, our culture and our politics back to this original understanding of freedom which, by the way, whether the founders knew it explicitly or not, reaches back far beyond John Locke and other Enlightenment political theorists to St. Thomas Aquinas and ultimately to the Bible. That major role is going to have to be played by lay Catholics. And that means all of us, not just Catholics who take up political life as a vocation. We are going to have to be courageous in speaking to friends, neighbors, and uh, business associates about why the legal protection of life from conception to natural death is not some strange piece of Catholic theological mumbo jumbo, it's essential to a law-governed democracy. We are going to have to be courageous in business, resisting the bullying or threats of social movements, demanding that we burn incense to false gods. We are going to have to support Catholic equivalents of Jack Phillips, the courageous owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop, in Lakewood, Colorado, and defend religious freedom in full. We are going to have to support Catholic health care professionals who decline to participate in the culture of death, as their colleagues are currently being compelled to do in Canada at risk of their professional careers. We are going to have to be supportive of Catholic health care professionals who refuse to participate in the practice of abortion, euthanasia, or Catholic pediatricians and others who refuse to participate in the child abuse, and that is what it is, of transgendering prepubescent boys and girls and teenagers. My daughter, the pediatrician, thanks you for your support. And in doing all this, we are going to have to create the equivalent in various aspects of our life of, of what I think of as one of the great accomplishments of Catholic lay people in, in consort with Protestant, Jewish, and secular colleagues who understand living in the truth about the right of life, right to life, have done since Roe versus Wade we have created 3,500 crisis pregnancy centers across America, uh, which demonstrate that the Catholic ethic of freedom lived nobly uh, does not mean simply making legal arguments or political arguments. It means effective service to women in crisis, uh, not simply argument. None of this is going to be easy. Uh, but keep this in mind as we continue to try to get now into focus. Nothing is more exhilarating than bringing others to Christ. Nothing is more exhilarating than that, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, 
friends, neighbors, acquaintances, whatever. Nothing is more exhilarating than bringing others to Christ. And that gives us that, I think, fundamental spiritual fact, gives us a way to measure the quality of our own discipleship. It is important that we have a regular Catholic practice, sacraments, prayer, spiritual reading, etc. But each Lent, each of us needs to enter a kind of new catechumenate and ask ourselves how over the past year have I brought others to Christ, either bringing back those who have strayed away or introducing those who have never met him. We need an annual examination of conscience on this fundamental point, how am I living my life as a missionary disciple? Because that is what each one of us was baptized to be. In the church of the 21st century in the third millennium, as John Paul II reminded us, missionaries are not simply brave men and women who go to exotic parts of the world to bring the gospel where it has never been heard before. Each of us received a missionary commission at our baptism. Each of us heard through our parents or our grandparents, or we heard it personally, if we were baptized as an adult, that great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. And the most important measure of our discipleship is how well we are bringing others to Christ. This is going to be hard, but also keep in mind that nothing can be more satisfying to a genuine patriot than being part of giving our country a new birth of freedom lived nobly. We're not setting a very admirable example to each other or to the world right now. And that is a great loss. I've had the privilege over the past 40 years of working with many brave men and women, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Cuba and elsewhere, who have taken what John Paul II called at the United Nations in 1995, the risk of freedom. Without exception, those brave men and women looked to the United States as a model of freedom lived nobly. And the measure of our patriotism, I suggest, is our capacity to help give our country a new birth of freedom lived nobly and not simply decadently. All of this is going to be hard, and yet we should always remember that at the end of our lives, the question that is going to be posed of, uh, to us is not going to be, were you successful? The question posed to all of us is going to be, were you faithful? The liturgy reminds us of all this, uh, this challenge to purify the church, this challenge to heal and rebuild a wounded culture. In the preface, the eighth preface for use in Sundays of the year, which reads, when your children were scattered far by sin, through the blood of your son and the power of the spirit, you gathered them again to yourself so that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity and made into the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit might to the praise of your manifold wisdom be manifest as the church. Let us be that church purified for mission. Let us be that church, a light to this nation. Let us go set the world ablaze with the divine love that has touched each of our hearts in Christ Jesus. Glory be to him forever. Thank you.